86. So right now, those are edge cases, but they're becoming more and more frequent. Question? Um, yeah, from a, from a traditional IT perspective, mm -hmm. if we accept the fact that sooner or later this is coming, <coughs> what are there things that we can or should be doing now to yes. make sure that we are? Well, give me, give me, ready? give me, give me a few minutes, and I'll, I will answer that. Before you get to that, I've got a question. Sure. You're saying there's 34 million some people in the U.S. using. <laughs> yep, just in the U.S. That's actually using. So is this is this people at home with their Blu-ray player, or is this? Uh, I mean, like, how many people here are using IPv6? I said I can't. Okay. Pretty much how what many, I was expecting. Yeah. How well? Right? I guess. But, how but, many people make a point of checking? What, which protocol you're using? Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, if you get a Comcast, if you have Comcast internet at home, right? But Comcast will do an IPv6. Yeah. But how many? You know, you, you get a, you, you get that at home. You put a wireless access point That's plug true. in your router, if right? It doesn't and then you do your, and then you do your your uh, Blu-ray player, your Apple TV, or whatever you've got. None of that's IPv6, is it? Um, some of it is. Um, so I can tell you my Blu-ray player does support IPv6, you have to right. turn it on. My printer supports IPv6, you have to turn it on. It's not enabled by default? No. Right, so all, this, all, right. all these people have equipment that can do it but don't do it. I'm just curious who these 34 million people are. Um, actually, so... I have a hunch that if, most of them don't know they're doing it. No. <laughs> if, well, I mean, it's, you know what, so, you know, my, my standard joke with networking when I'm teaching a network class, Right? Is whenever I have a problem at home, my wife or my kids will say the internet's broken. <laughs> right? You know, is the internet really broken? But I mean, it's just it's just kind of an illustration that nobody nobody cares if they're using IPv4, or IPv6, or IPX, or whatever. Right? Can I get to Facebook? That that's all that matters. As far as how I get to Facebook, I could care less. Does does it work? So so most most people are could care less. So we got to get to the point where it just works. Interesting note about Facebook, internally they're all IPv6. Yeah, yep. So is it the biggest problem today with adoption is the fact that there is no ROI or perceived ROI on it? So, so you're going to spend 10, 20, 100 grand, maybe you know half a million dollars and not get anything for that other than maybe the ability to link to some application that's IPv6 only? So look at it. Look at it like this. I, I, I'll tell you right now. You're not going to like this answer. But look at it like this. What's your R ROI for having electricity or heating? <laughs> uh, it's it's just it's it's infrastructure, right? There's right. In, in and of itself, it's worthless. I mean, the, its only value is it's a platform that you need to to build other things on. Now the hard part is deploying it is non-trivial. So you don't want to do too much, right? Because I agree. But that's the whole you point. It's going to cost you equipment that's and right. time to deploy uh, it, it and, but you're not going to get anything immediately out of that. Yeah, you, you're not going to get it faster. Well, it's it's a, not like okay. going, you know, spending well, it's time. Bit, it's a little bit like Y2K, right? Mm. Think about it. During the '90s, yeah. people didn't want to invest in Y2K because they didn't see the problem. Right? But there was a hard problem. We knew we had to do it by December 31st, 1999. Mm -hmm. We had to, right? There's no flight. Here, there's, there's, no, yeah. there's no deadline. There's no deadline. There's been deadlines, but we've blown past Basically, them. Basically, IPv6. We were going to run out in the 90s. IPv6 IPV is asymptotic, right? So with IPv6, I have an asymptotic function. Yeah. And if I look at that function, it's basically my pain threshold, right? I'm never going to get. It's probably never, it's probably, there's always a way to, to make it work. Sure. But the question is, how much pain are we willing to put up with in terms of all the cost with applications and overhead and all the other stuff until we switch? And to be honest, I don't know. Um, let, let me, let me, let me uh, get to these real quick. Yeah. So this is just showing, um, if I look at different market segments, right? We've mainly been talking about enterprise. But if I look at telecom, if I look at all my tier one providers, they are fully deployed. So this is interesting because, let me tell you, working for one, tier one ISPs are ultra, ultra, ultra conservative. I mean, they're like the federal government, right? That they won't spend a penny, believe me, they will not spend a penny if they're not convinced that they have to do it. And look, they're 100% deployed, right? So this is like AT&T, Level 3, Cogent, NTT, Verizon, Sprint, all those companies. What do you right? mean by 100% fully deployed internally? Right? In, okay. in, terms, in terms of their core, well, user, user access services, maybe not. But in terms of their core and all their business-facing stuff, it's, it's done. 
So in terms, this is transit. So in other words, can they route traffic through? All of them can, and that. Now, if um, if we look really, and if, if you look at transit providers, or basically this is really the internet, right? Probably the top 100, or maybe the top 300. I mean, that's that's basically all the major companies. Maybe you know, top thousand. Now you're getting into kind of the small players. Most people tend to deal with the top one or 200. So. Yeah, there's 11,000 transit providers, but those, you know, the, the bulk of the internet is probably the top one or 200. And if we look at all up to the top 1,000, we're pretty far along. So when you hear that IPv6 is early adoption, that's true in the enterprise space, but that's not true as a whole, right? So just one one thing I wanted to show. Um, all right, I. I wanted to briefly mention this because people still talk about it. I don't, I don't think this matters anymore. Okay, I, I throw it up here. So we have two, if you don't understand the RIR system, and I don't, I don't want to go into it because, um, like I said, I don't think it's that interesting. Aaron is the one we use for the US and Canada, and they're down to like, I think, roughly seven million addresses. They're gonna run out this year. This is saying April, it might stretch out into May or June, but for sure it's gonna happen this year. Do I think it's real? I mean, you'll see some press about it. Do I think it really matters? No, I don't think so. I, I think I really with exhaustion, I think this is a distraction. This is not what's going to push us to IPv6. What's going to push us is when I'm deploying trillions of devices on my network, that's, that's what's going to force me. Because it's going to be so painful to try and make that work with IPv4, that's what's going to push me. Um, but because everybody talks about it, I at least wanted to throw it in there. Um, Okay, so in terms of, so let me, let me go through this fast because I don't want to, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, in, in terms of, do I need it? Okay, so I do this for a living, right? So, so I'm biased, so take it with a grain of salt. But here's, here's what I tell people that ask me. Um, you need to closely monitor IoT. So I can say, I can tell you that most verticals including in Michigan, have a lot of IoT activities going on. I mean, at, like, like for example, if I look at the automotive, IoT initiatives are basically touted by the CEOs of all the automotive companies in Michigan. I mean, they are key strategic initiatives. Autonomous and connected vehicles, I mean, Ford and GM see that as one of the top things. So these are huge. So you definitely, and remember, remember that disconnect about the people driving those initiatives are outside of IT. So you need to, mon I'm not saying you should do it, but you definitely have to monitor those initiatives and be clear about what does that mean for me? If my company's doing these strategic things, what do I have to support? Um, the other big thing is mobility. So I have four major, I, our four major wireless carriers in the US, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile. Mm. Uh, Verizon is fully deployed. If I have a Verizon phone, unless it's ancient, um, or I have a Verizon hotspot, it's dual stack. It's been like that that way for years. If I look at Verizon's traffic, um, I think almost two thirds of it is running IPv6. So the, the majority of Verizon's wireless traffic is IPv6. So even for example, I know a lot of the automotive companies they get their cellular devices and their hotspots from Verizon. So they they have IPv6. They might not have intended to do it, but when I'm taking that hotspot and putting my laptop on. Unless I disabled it, I'm, a, I'm on an IPv6 network. So that's one thing you want to watch. T-Mobile, the other interesting thing with them, T-Mobile setup is IPv6 only. So there's no IPv4. They get around that using something called 464XLAT. They basically, this, this is really interesting. So with 464XLAT, I pretend like I have an IPv4 address to make things like Skype work. I translate it to IPv6. It gets to a gateway and then I translate it back to IPv4. <laughs> so it can cause some real interesting problems if you have to troubleshoot it. But this, and, and uh, T Mobile is not the only one. There's two other major carriers and more that are looking at it deploying something like this. So the other thing is, in terms of if I choose not to, to support IPv6, more and more, for my workers that are using you know, hotspots or cellular connectivity or something like that, I might be stuck troubleshooting 464 x so keep that in mind. Okay, if I look at all the major ISPs, they are all far down the path. Um, a lot of them are done. Comcast, for example, is fully deployed. Um, or, or they're, like I said, they're well down the path. Um, 
because we don't have enough addresses, all the major carriers that, that I know of are using CGN. Which means that, so now, you decide how strong this argument is. Because um, it's, it's, there's a lot of different opinions, so I'll just give you the, the scenario. The scenario is, if you don't choose to deploy IPv6, then basically a lot of your customers are going through CGN, right? Now, if I'm a carrier and my customer, you know, you're not my customer, and I have lots of customers going to you, and I'm doing CGN, how much do I care about your content? What do you think? Yeah, I don't. I don't care. So, if the user has problems accessing your application because their carrier is using CGN, who do you think they're going to blame? <coughs> That's right. They're going to blame the. I can tell you from firsthand experience, they're going to blame the content provider. And, and and I don't know if you've ever called up a carrier support because I have to deal with them too. <laughs> Good luck. If you if you crack that one, let me know. Um, as Jim mentioned, Silicon Valley, all the Silicon Valley companies are IPv6 deployed. Google, Microsoft, Oracle, Facebook, Facebook's IPv6 only, right? So, so all the major tech companies long ago have gone IPv6. I was actually talking to a manager in the, in the automotive industry the other day, and he was like, you know, with IPv6, you know, what's Toyota doing? And you know what I said? I said, you know what, I wouldn't worry so much about Toyota. I think your competition is Google and Apple, right? Look at look at Google's time frame for rolling out an autonomous vehicle. They're one of the most aggressive companies in terms of testing the technology, in terms of coming up with all the maps, in terms of rolling it out. So this potentially can change the landscape. So there, there's a lot of major companies that are really investing heavily in, in trying to capitalize on this. So again, you know, I'm not saying you should do it. Just be aware of what's going on. Right, home offering is the truth. That's it. <laughs> okay, in terms of uh, in terms of what to do, um, so I, I would highly recommend the lab. Um, a lot of companies have labs. If you have no lab and no lab budget, um, you can use your house. That actually works pretty well because it's mainly uh, no joke. I mean, a lot of it's just learning the basics, right? So um, I would strongly recommend though playing around before you go into production, right? Anybody remember this? You do not want to deploy it because IPv6 is not, I don't, I don't think I would call it hard for somebody that has a networking background, but you're not just gonna, you're not gonna take a one week class and be an expert, right? I don't know if anybody remembers learning TCP IP. Who learned TCP IP in a couple days or a week? <laughs> yeah, so this is the same, right? It's gonna take, give yourself some time. Um, so basic goals, right? We wanna be able to connect to the IPv6 internet, we want to be able to allow access from it. We want to be able to publish applications to it. And we want to allow our users to get to it. So um, connectivity, I'll go through this quick. Um, first thing you need to do if you're looking at this is you need to talk to your ISP. So um, I, I will tell you, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, even work, working for a major ISP, that you are going to have to put your patient hat on for this. <laughs> because even my own company, I have talked to people that have told me, you know, and, and keep in mind, right, I do IPv6 for a living, and I've talked to people in my own company that were like, nobody does that. Why would you want to do that? And I'm just like, what a freaking <laughs> So I, I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you, even recently doing some deployments, even working with tier one ISPs, I, I uh, I wasn't under contract, I'd make fun of them on uh, Nanog, but uh, <coughs> even tier one ISPs have people that don't know what they're doing. So, and in fairness, right, if I look at IPv6, if 15% of people have it, that means 85% don't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all right, I, I can appreciate that. So, there are a lot of knowledgeable people, but you're not gonna get to them on your first try. You're gonna have to work a little. Uh, I, I wish I had better news, but. That's how it is. So um, if, you know, unless you have a really, really small ISP, if you have any sizable company, they should have it. Uh, as far as I know, all the major companies have it. If, if you have a really small company and they don't have it, I'd look at switching it. Because there's so many, I mean, seriously, there are so many ISPs and there's so many deals. I mean, you could probably switch, get IPv6, and find cheaper service. I mean, there's just there's just so there's no there's no reason in 2015 to settle for that. So I really I think that should just be a given. 
Um, if they talk about a surcharge, same thing, I would switch. I mean, it should, should just be free. Um, other than, you know, they might charge you a one-time provisioning fee, but that's it. That there's no service, premium. it's just a given. It's a standard part of internet access. So um, just hitting on your point that you're not going to get the good support right away, I'm looking at the AT&T site, and I'm trying to figure out, well, how would, what do I need to do? One of the things is updating the firmware on my two-wire device. And it has this statement. It says, please do not call customer care requesting for the firmware update sooner or for the exact date, as we cannot provide this information. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, it's... Uh It'll definitely test your patience, unfortunately. I mean, that'll get better over time, especially at the especially at the small office consumer level. Like, I like Comcast. There's a lot of talented people at Comcast. Um, you know, I've had a Comcast connection for a long time, um, and uh, their their support. I mean, I, I even have a business class connection, and it's it's awful. I mean, they have, they have no clue. So you know, unfortunately, that's uh, just try to cancel that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, and then the last thing is when you're getting it, you want native service. So, you know, I guess if you have somewhere that's kind of in a remote location, you might be stuck with tunnel service where basically they're tunneling it over IPv4. In general, though, you know, in any, in any significant market area, I mean, this, this should be a good, should be easy to get. It should not be a big deal. Um, if, if you get it through MPLS, um, they're, they're going to, you know, every, uh, every carrier has their own name for technologies, but if they're doing 6B or 6VP, you, know, you don't have to understand what it is, but if, if they say they're doing one of those, that's fine too. So but you, you basically want native or MPLS access. You, you don't want anything else. MPLS is IPv6? Uses IPv6? No. Actually, MPLS is an IPv4 technology, but you don't care because MPLS is what the service provider uses to basically share their network with customers and create the illusion that every customer has their own network. So that's the service provider's problem. But, but from the customer's point of view, it looks like native IPv6 access. And, and there's no, it's not, it's not, unlike other tunneling technologies, there's no degradation. It works fine. So MPLS is kind of, because the reason you generally don't want tunnel is if, if I have native access, it's direct. If I have tunnel access, I might go over here and come back. It's suboptimal. Uh, so with MPLS, there's one path. So you don't have to worry about that. So I, it, it's it, like, that's, it's kind of a whole other talk, but, but in the MPLS case, it's fine. In any other case, probably not. All right, so I, I have a basic checklist here. Like I said, I mean, you can Google this stuff. I'm not going to go through it. I mean, if, if you have a single connection, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you put, you put in your address. Um, it sh should usually be a 64. There are exceptions for, for the uh, for the site root length, your default route. Um, the, the one thing that you have to be careful of is from an access point of view, make sure you understand all your security features and controls and you have parity for V6. Don't just turn it on. Right? Remember, V4 and V6 are ships in the night. So if I just turn on V6, then my device is totally wide open. So Telnet, SSH, web management, SNMP, anything else, syslog, it's all no controls unless I enable them. So be, be careful with that one. So th this is relatively straightforward as long as you're careful with make sure, making sure you understand all the features. Um, if you have, uh, if you're multi-homed, or in other words, you have multiple network connections, I would strongly advise you to, to get some help. So you don't, have, you don't have to do like a super expensive engagement, but you should at least have, you should at least talk to somebody and have Revere can fix. Because like I said, I mean, if, if, you know, if, uh, if I'm talking to tier ones and they're messing it up, then somebody with no experience, I, I think that would be, pretty tough to get everything perfect on the first try. So at least have somebody do a look over or something like that. All right, um, equipment. Okay, so this goes back to the costs. So once you look at bringing it in, in order to bring it in, my, my border equipment, unless that's managed by my ISP, if, if that's the case, then you don't care. But if you manage your, your equipment that connects you to your ISP, it might already support it. You know, if you've gotten it within the last few years, you should be fine. If, if it's older than that, you might need an upgrade. A lot of times you just need a software upgrade. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal as long as it's under support contract. <laughs> if it's not under support contract or you have to buy anything, then there's a cost. A lot of times the cost is not bad. Yeah. So then it's just a simple question. If you have the budget for it, get it. If you don't, that's, that's, the, that's the biggest reason to do it now and not wait. 
Because if you do it ahead of time and it's not in the budget, no problem. You plan for next year and you put it in next year's budget. Right? That way you don't have to do a fire drill. So that, that's one advantage of doing that's it ahead of time. That's great for home user. I mean, they, they want to soak you. I'm looking and they're saying if you got these two routers, then you got to spend 100 bucks in order to upgrade. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all over the map. But that's a one-time cost. Yeah. What I've seen is like the cheap access points and stuff that you buy. Yeah, you can buy. Yeah, it's basically a throwaway device. Yeah, they, so you have to buy it how you want it. Well, the problem is if you get a certain carrier, you are stuck with a certain type of gateway. So let me let me uh, let me let me let me keep going here just so I can finish real yeah, quick. Yeah, no, sorry. All right, next, no, no problem. No, uh, next one is remote access. So if you set up your router, which is generally pretty straightforward. The next step is remote access. So in other words, if I'm at home <coughs> or if I'm partnering with another company, I want them to be able to access me. Now, um, I don't know if I don't know if any of you do any kind of uh, networking, but uh, I've already run into quite a few cases on a so, like a small office home office type connection where you can no longer get a public address. So you'll basically order like for example, if you get a DSL circuit or some kind of broadband. They'll say, you're going to use our gateway, and we don't offer public addresses, and you're going to like it. And if you don't like it, then I, I literally have told me, if you don't like it, you know, go, go buy service from somebody else. So if you're in a situation like that, and you can get IPv6, then you don't care. Because with VPN, the VPN itself can be IPv6, but all the user traffic inside can be IPv4. So in other words, you don't care, right? You're, you're the part that deals with the user and connects to your network is still IPv4, is still beautiful, is still transparent. But you're using IPv6 to solve the lack of address space problem, and just the VPN itself is IPv6. So this is great if you're dealing with places where you need remote access or management access, but you can't get a public address. So I used to have uh, static IPs, IP4s, mm -hmm. and I eliminated that thinking I probably don't need it, but I do want to be able to access my devices that are at home from remote locations. Can I do that with IPv6? Do I have to go to AT&T and purchase something from them? or? I mean, it, j it just depends on, um, so like AT&T cellular doesn't have v6 yet, but if you have a Verizon cellular, then yes. If you have T-Mobile cellular, oh, okay. yes. so it I'm saying depends on. Like laptop to uh, home server. Depends on where you're connecting from. Some, some places have IPv6, but you know, like it's only 10 to 15%, right? So most don't. So if, if you have, if you're connecting from a location that has native V6 access or tunnel, then yes, but if not, no. Um, but well, let me come back to that, because I'm gonna... Okay, no, so what I'm, stuck on, what I'm stuck on is my device at home, my, my server at home, mm -hmm. that has a unique IPv6 address? Yes. Okay. If you get IPv6, it's gonna be unique. And okay. Um, it, depends. it should be, it depends but on the provider. some providers don't. Depends on the provider. But but there's ways to deal with that, just like before, right? You can do dynamic DNS registration and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, some of them they usually all can do it. Some of them might charge you, charge you more. Yeah. Okay, um, publishing. So this is the next one, right? If I want to make my application accessible. Um, so in, in terms of making your application accessible, the operating systems are no problem. Those have supported for a long time. Most of your major platforms and databases support it. Um, I, I can't think of too many exceptions unless you're, unless you're using something that's pretty old. Um, but the work is, let's say I have some kind of an application and I'm migrating it to v6. Things like all my database fields, my user input forms, address parsing routines, stuff like that, all that's going to need to be revisited. Mm -hmm. So it's typically not trivial. So it's not like you're going to go and redo all your applications. There's no way. It's what's your business case. Mm -hmm. So the way you deal with that is um, there, there's three options. So just in the interest of time, generally you want to do the last one. So NAT64, um, it sounds easy, but there's something called MTU mismatch, which I'm not going to, it's, it's, it's somewhat involved, but basically it's very hard to troubleshoot and you're going to run into it somewhat frequently. So I would say that makes this technology undesirable. Reverse proxy is, is pretty straightforward, but the problem is performance. Whenever you use a proxy, you're going to have scaling and performance limitations. So you know, for a small setup, it's fine. For, for a massive setup, you're going to be disappointed with the performance. 
um, most sizable companies use a load balancer, right? So if you have a load balancer, any recent load balancer is going to support this. So basically what happens is the load balancer publishes an IPv6 address, the user connects to that IPv6 address, and then the load balancer, I mean, forgive me, I'm going to be kind of sloppy with my terminology, but the, the load balancer translates it please. to IPv4 the to the application. And the library is be closing because of the way it does this, this is the most transparent the method. Will begin to right? Most applications work really closing. well with this, and this is kind of the easy button. The nice thing about this is you can make your applications accessible with relatively minimal, with a minimal amount of work, right? So it gives you time. So now, now you're not going through CGN, you're in complete control of the connection, you're not going through cascading NAT, and you can, you can make stuff available, right? You don't have, you don't have to convert right away, because that, that's, that's really where the cost is. The network part is easy. The application part is always a lot. It's a huge undertaking. Dual stack too, right? If, uh, That's true, but if you dual stack, your application has to be able to deal with it, and that requires a lot of testing, and some can. A lot of applications. No, I mean, no, I'm talking about to the load balancer. Your yeah, public yeah, address. Yeah, yep. You could have an IPv4 exactly. and an IPv6 public address. Exactly. And the load balancer would yeah. turn it all into IPv4 and send it to the application. Yeah, excellent point. So you're 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 basically just adding v6. You're, you're yeah. still you're, you're not losing your v4 capabilities. Be good for transition. Yeah, excellent transition. Um, and then finally, this is for your users to get out. Dual stacking is ideal. That, that unless you have a small network, that's a lot of work. Um, proxy, proxy can be pretty good here. If I have a limited number of users, I can get a commercial solution or an open source solution that works pretty well. Um, and then there is tunneling. I'm not going to get into that. That that's really better for labs, but it's a possibility. Isotab is built into Windows. And then finally, VPN. So the VPN one, just coming back to the point earlier, um, if you have something at home, for example, and you're at a Starbucks and they don't have IPv6, there's a lot of service providers that will give you a cheap VPN connection where you can get dual stack. And then using that VPN connection, then you can go anywhere on the IPv6 internet. So you could either you could purchase a third-party service, or you could set this up on your own to allow, allow people to get IPv6 access. So this, I, I, I went through this fast, but um, I mean, like I said, I mean, technically, all this stuff you can Google. I mean, there's nothing to it. I mean, all the major products have pretty extensive IPv6 guides to be able to figure it out. The, the main thing is understanding what to watch for so you don't get blindsided and thinking about what, what you want to enable. So hopefully, at a high level, that helps. So any, any other questions? Can I jump to a more technical, sure. advanced type of sure. uh, virtual networking? Mm -hmm. So uh, if I want to set up devices on my home network that uh, make use of like a uh, you know, VMware or something like that, is that something that an AT&T would support or you know, can you do that or is there some kind of issues with, uh, you know? I mean, all, all the hypervisors support IPv6, so there's, uh, well, OpenStack is more recent, but um, if you look at like VMware, if you look at Hyper-V, if you look at KVM, and uh, what's the other one? Virtual Box? Virtual, what's the other major one? Not Virtual Box, that, um, more for like an enterprise level. What's Microsoft? Microsoft is Hyper-V, KVM, but uh, Citrix, Zen. Mm -hmm. Oh, Zen. So all, all of those support it, right? I mean, Except Hyper-V is kind of an exception, but with the rest of them, they're, they're just em emulating a switch. So they're emulating layer two. So so for the most part, they don't care. They're oblivious, right? Because IPv6 is in layer three. Other than their administrative interface. That's true, but I mean, they've, um, they ha there are some quirks, but um, they, they all support it. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically like any other network. Yeah, I mean, unless, do you have something specific or, I mean, I, I can tell you, I have VMware at home and I'm running it with IPv6 and. Yeah, but the, the carrier, the Comcast or whoever, or ATT, they're not going to give you, they're not going to route a whole network to your network. They're going to give you an input. Um, it depends. So. I mean, unless it's business. Um, yeah, so for I, for business class, you get a slash 56, really? which is 256 networks. Um, for consumer class, I Actually, I thought for consumer class, they were doing 56 too. Wow. 
It, it, but it depends on the provider. Some will only give you a slash 64. So. You said 56 networks or 56 devices? So, um, so a slash 50, okay, so in IPv6, um, in general, my, my, my subnet mask and my cider line is always going to be a slash 64. It's going to be fixed. So if I get a slash 56 from my carrier,